It's the Craggy Rugby Podcast. It's the midweek edition prior to the Leinster away match. On the line, I've got Danny Deegan. How are things, guys? And Danny McKenzie. Evening, Alan. Okay, before we, we talk to, to Danny and Lindley, let's um let's go straight to the press conference today where Captain Jared Butler was talking to William Davis and we also have Andy Friend. Was it simply a failure to fix on the hoof? Once the pattern sort of started to split apart a little bit against Ulster, that you did, you talked about decision making, but really the game seemed to get away from you very quickly at the start of the second half, having dominated the first half and scored two fine tries and had a lead at half time. Yeah, after the Ulster game, or immediately after the game, I pretty I would have agreed with you with you there for sure. Um, but then you watch the game back and you realise, you know, we did a lot of things well. Um, you have to keep the ball probably more so when you're playing against the wind. And then, you know, those passages there where we, we did 15 phases, worked our way up the field into a good position to put up, you know, a contestable or, or at least exit our half any, anyway, effectively. And um, just that last kick or that last phase, it just, it didn't stick. And that was kind of all of a sudden you find yourself back in the 22 doing the same thing. So I won't, I won't say that, you know, we didn't, we had opportunities to to build pressure, but we just weren't able to do it. And what would you what do you what do you put that down to? Is that pressure from Ulster or concentration from Connacht, or is it a, you know what, what have you have you found the reason for that? Have you have you got something that you can get a hold of to fix? I think a little bit is um you know just that individual skill. I think that comes down to a little bit of compass. Uh, concentration yeah and it's um you know also had a really good line speed the d was spot on it was probably one of the most physical games that we've played this year and you know they're not the biggest side but they threw that they threw themselves into everything and they and they put us under pressure like we did with with them in the first half so it was definitely a a two-way street there and um and and that was our undoing in the end i think the main one there i think is a bit of game management and composure uh and being able to to manage when another team's got momentum is probably the, the main learning for us this week. Uh, but, you know, we've got, we definitely have the players and the caliber of players to be able to deal with. Uh, we just need to be able to deal with it sooner. Leinster are probably a better side that, well, they are a better side than Ulster. They've, they've gone unbeaten for so long uh, and they're cruising along in the pro 14. It's a, it's a difficult place to go. So, so what are you looking for on Saturday night? Yeah, we're expect- expecting another Inter-Pro quality game. We imagine it'll be very physical as well. Um, geez, we've only just started kind of the, the review of, of, of Leinster now, but like you said, they're an extremely good team and um, anything less than 80-minute performance, you know, you're not going to be able to beat Leinster. We've seen it before. We've been over there and played 69 minutes of good footy and not come away with a win. And then also there, we've, we've probably played 40, 40 minutes. So... Um, it's going to be about consistency. It's going to be about, you know, taking the game to Leinster. I think they're they're a very good team when they, when they've got things on their term terms. And if you're going to let them play and just try and kind of counter everything, then you're going to have a hard time, a hard day at the office. So um, going up there and and trying to play with some confidence, I think it's going to be really important. Trying to play on top of them, uh, trying to be aggressive because, like I said, you see so many teams go over there and and try and weather the storm, but it's an 80-minute storm if you let it be. Is, is it almost a shot to nothing for you? Just to be honest, nobody expects Connacht to go there and win. Yeah, um, I think you get to go over there and you get to yeah throw caution to the wind and, 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 and try things because you know that, like you say, you can't really play conservative. You have to go for it and you have to, and you have to try things. And we have lost the last three weeks in a row, so... I, I expect, and I think our, our group as a whole, we expect to bounce back and some energy. And you know, if you if you can't get up for for an interpro against Leinster, then what can you get up for? Uh, after the game on Sunday, you you used an expression they out enthused us, um, and I, that's referring to Ulster. Is that a, a sort of a polite euphemism for uh, it all fell apart and the, the the game plan shredded in the second half for Connacht? 
No, it's not. It it is recognition of the fact that I thought um, I thought they they brought incredible energy uh, to the game and um, they made the most of their opportunities. I think when we look at the game plan, two things happened. First thing, it was like someone flicked a switch in that second half and the, and the wind turbine kicked up and now we're running into a breeze which hadn't been there beforehand. And the second thing, the way we managed that because we were behind on the scoreboard needed to be better. When I look back on it, William, I actually thought it wasn't a lack of energy from us. It was just, again, accuracy at the, t at the key moments that let us down um, and, and a game management um, into a breeze that hadn't been there uh, where we need to be better. I'm tempted to say normally when you score three tries against Ulster at home, you'll win. Um, and that was the good part of the game. But the good part of the game was very good, but the parts of the game where it wasn't working were quite poor. So there's, there's a level of consistency there. You need to maybe get a little bit more into the middle uh, during a game. Yeah, I thought there were lots of really good parts of the game. I said, I thought our set piece, well, our scrum certainly was dominant. Um, we didn't get what I felt was due reward for that. Uh, and, and in fact, you know, some of the penalties against us there just, just blowing my mind as to how that, that's even happening. What seemed to happen though, William, with every penalty that we gave, and we gave away 11, out of those 11, uh, I tracked them every week as I share with you people, there was one which I would consider a red penalty. Um, but out of those, so that's a, it's an error on our behalf. Um, there are things such as orange penalties where I can see what we're doing, I can see what the referee sees, that's rugby, that can be a penalty, I can see either side of it, and there are what, what I call green penalties, which is, I believe, it's a referee error. Um, and, and we had a multitude of, of orange and greens where every time we seem to give one, and, and this is a compliment, and, and you've got to give credit to Ian Madigan, shy of one kick, he, he knocked over three points, and he just kept that scoreboard ticking. So... Yeah, we do score three tries. Um, we concede two. We actually had the best defensive record we've had for the season. Uh, we made over 90 tackles. Um, they had two clean line breaks. Uh, but out of those two clean line breaks, they scored two tries. So, uh, you know, there was some perfect storm stuff happening there for them and, and not necessarily for us. So looking at all that, how, how do you you'd take the fixings required into Saturday at the RDS against... Uh... And on another unbeaten side in the Pro 14, who seem to have been unbeaten now for forever in this competition, Leinster. Yeah, we just talked again this morning on that call and said, you know, it, it, it's sport. Sometimes, sometimes you fail, um, but it's only a failure if you don't learn from it. So, what are the key learnings we can take out of it? There are individual things, individual errors from from individual players um, where they need to take ownership on that, and they need to be better. Uh, and then there are also game management things, which we've discussed earlier there, which where we need to be better as a collective in the way we manage that breeze. So who knows what we're going to get this coming Saturday at, at, at the RDS, but, uh, you know, odds on that there's probably going to be some weather involved and we need to show that we are better at managing that and we, we need to show as individuals that we're better at, at either making our tackles when they need to happen or... or um, or looking after football and winning, winning key moments when it needs to happen. So that's an ongoing process, mate. And we never stop. I often, I often ask this question, but I think it's key to Saturday. What, what's, what's the biggest thing you're looking for in terms of a fix? And, and what if, what's the thing that if you get wrong, you're going to get into real bother here? The biggest thing in terms of a fix is, is those individual moments when you have to make that tackle or you have to hit that line up, or you have to carry that ball through contact or you have to win that the, the race to the breakdown. It's just winning those little moments and that's on the weekend. You know, statistically, um, we were close. We had 10 turnovers to their 11. Um, we had 11 penalties to their 10. Both teams won six, you know, the 50-50 six all. Um, we won one percent of our collisions, but we ended the game because at key moments when it needed to happen, the tackle needed to be made, or, or you know, the line out needed to be hit. We didn't do it. Um, so against the Leinster or any other team that's 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 in that in the top echelon of the of the, of the Pro 14, 
you've got to nail those moments and that's where we need to be better at nailing those moments at the appropriate time where it matters they still seem a little bit down Lindley, after um that that defeat at the weekend we we didn't get your thoughts after the match because you were writing your your excellent irish times report um which captured the game perfectly from my reading of it um what were your thoughts now that you've had a couple of days to think about it um well obviously the result is disappointing for the, the the first thing and it and it was a you would appear on paper that it was a very good opportunity to actually get that one over Ulster because they did have so many of their frontline players missing i suppose the other disappointing aspect i guess and through i don't know the reasoning behind it or whatever or it wasn't really thought about was the fact that the weather wasn't taken into account or the possibility of changeable weather in Galway, I think, was a huge factor, which really was the determining factor, I think, in the second half. To turn around in the second half and then all of a sudden find the wind from being, you know, zilch wind to having a wind in your face was extremely, extremely difficult, I think. And I think that totally set uh, the pattern of the second half because it made it so much easier for Ulster just to kick the ball down the field launch their launch their platform launch their attacks whereas kind of were battling if they kicked the ball you know it, w- it was going to be difficult if they ran the ball they were putting themselves under pressure the forwards were tiring so i think um that did the win did detract from what essentially could have been you know a a, a connaught win it certainly could and if you like you look at it from the point of view of that's two weeks in a row Connacht have left the field at half time where we were feeling pretty positive about their performance and we're looking forward to a second half and two weeks in a row decisions one straight after half time when Bundy made a silly decision with his decision to pull back someone and then this week we the decision was made before the game started but um they had huge effects on on how Connacht did in this in the second half of both of those games and when you look at it in Stats wise, and I think Danny's going to back this up. Connacht actually did quite well. Yeah, they did. They did extremely well um, in the first half. Uh, they didn't miss a single tackle. Only had to make twenty three, uh, and they dominated possession and territory. So they had seventy seven percent possession and eighty nine percent territory in the first half. Yeah, I think you're right, Lindy. I think the wind was the the biggest factor in what happened in the second half. Because even if you look at some of the scores, I've just watched the game again today. They only made two line breaks. Now, admittedly, both of them were in our 22 and they scored off them. But we'd made a number of line breaks and, and didn't quite score off them. And that, that's the that's the frustrating bit. That... I think Andy French was um, mentioned the, the, the win today. Mm. And he said that, you know, it, it was, di- it, it was, I mean, he alluded to the fact that it was difficult, but he said there were a number of things that Connor could have done in terms of kicking that he he gave the impression that people, the players were sitting back waiting for uh, either Keelan Blade or Kiramami and to kick the ball, which he said mm. was extremely mm. difficult. He did say suggest that it was then up to the 10, the 15 and the 12 to take that on board and to, for them to actually do some of the, the kicking. He also suggested that they should go narrow, I suppose, to introduce a variety of ways in which they could take the pressure off, particularly the pack. Yeah, and then following on from that, one of our one of our followers on Twitter, Thomas Finner, and asked a question about we seem to struggle getting quick ball because the opposition look like they're focusing on slowing us down at source. Is maybe that something that needs to be looked at in the next two? Well, weeks? I, I I do remember um, there was one particular the breakdown. There was there was a I think there was a lot of um, let's say shall we say Ulster were aware, very aware aware of that, and I think at one stage there was a clear breakdown where Connor were penalised. And in fact, I think it was um, their scrum half, Albie Mathewson, who appeared to be actually stopping the play, lying over the ball. You know, I mm-hmm. think Andy Friend did did allude to the fact that, did, suggested the fact that there were a number of areas that he thought that the refereeing, even the scrums, that Connacht should have got more out of the scrums, their dominance there from the referee. So, of course, there are issues, and I'm sure they'll put in the referee's report, et cetera, et cetera. So, there are, there, look, there are always areas in a game where you're going to have, you know, teams that have a method of trying to, to to stop a team that is on top in certain areas. And it takes, you know, sometimes a referee or maybe a word in the air of the referee by the captain or or something like that at halftime. I'm not sure what happened on the day. So, Danny, 
what would you be doing on the field if you were to try and stop that situation from arising? Well, I'd be kind of going, um, I guess we're, we're seeing two totally different types of captains that we have with Paul Boyle, uh, particularly in the, the racing game. You could see him really talking with uh, the ref that day uh, constantly, where at the weekend, I know Butler did speak to the ref, but there was more of a, a passiveness about it rather than the way Boyle would go with a bit more of authority. But that, that's that's purely down to captaining styles. Um, like, I've, I've played in those conditions where you're, where when Ulster scored their two tries, one thing I was kind of hoping we'd see is that someone standing up reading us the riot act because we needed, someone needed to read us the riot act because we weren't doing the right things. It's extremely difficult when you're playing in those situations, trying to kick the ball out. It doesn't go anywhere. Go, like there was a point where Matt Healy tried to clear from his 22 early in the second half and it barely went outside the 22. As a forward, that is, it's, it's, it's just extremely difficult to look at. You, you know, you, you've, you've released the pressure, but you've just straight away putting it back on you. So that's where you need your captain to really come in and start lighting the fire under guys and really pushing guys. That That's where we really need like a vocal captain. Well, I think Jared has always been a captain who um, leads by example. And I yes. think that's, that is very much his style. I think he is, obviously, he's a very well-educated lad from from Australia. Maybe he's got a softer approach than than other people have. Um, I 100% agree with you that he's definitely a guy that um, leads with example. That doesn't always work. And I think a game at the weekend when you're when you're struggling, when you're really up against it, struggling to get out of your own out of your own half, it it needs a little bit more. I guess I was kind of hoping that some of the older guys, uh, the guys that have been around, like we had quite a number of guys that had 100 caps. And we're talking about, we were surprised by the weather in Galway. So, someone has to pick that up. Um, we, we really need to start figuring out, guys really need to start figuring out how we can play that properly. Okay. I think we've, um, we've talked enough on that subject. Let's take a quick break before we um, talk about, we preview the Leinster game. We're actually, we're not going to talk about the Pro 16 this week because next week we're going to get, hopefully going to get Morgan Peake on from our South African correspondent so we can hear from down there as to exactly what's going on with regard to the Pro 16 as they see it. Uh, let's go for a quick break. We would like to thank all our patrons for their support in helping keeping the podcast going. If you would like to help ensure that we can keep providing the most comprehensive coverage of Connacht Rugby, you can do so by logging on to patreon.com slash craggyrugby and for less than the price of a cup or a pint a month, hit the join button. You can also spread the word about our podcast to anyone with even the faintest interest in Connacht Rugby and asking them to have a listen. You can let us know what you think of our coverage by contacting us on our Twitter handle at craggyrugbypod or by sending an email to craggyrugby at gmail.com. You can go to craggyrugby.com to listen to our back catalogue of over 300 episodes that cover the last five plus seasons of the highs and lows of not only the Connacht men's professional team and the Eagles, but also the exploits of the Connacht women's team in the Interpros. Remember, you can listen to us on your favourite podcast player by asking Alexa or Siri to play a Craggy Rugby podcast, or you can now even get us on YouTube. Just search for Craggy Rugby. Okay, before we talk about Leinster or um, Lindley there was a couple of guys went off to feel injured at the weekend do, do we have any updates? Yeah uh, Turnan O'Holloran in his first game back unfortunately and Colin de Butler they both left the foot they ha- apparently they have um, they're awake they've had scan- scans on their thighs and in- thigh injuries and they're awaiting results of that but it, it certainly doesn't look good um, and one has to feel for Turnan O'Holloran who spent so much time on the sideline and has just come just came back um, into the 15 jersey, but it looks possible that he could be out for a while again. Um, I think we we're, we might be going to get to see Ben O'Donnell. Yeah, Ben's it's it's, it's very exciting, isn't it, to think that we have a, an Aussie sevens player who's played something like 91 games and scored 47 tries um, set to start for us. Um, of course, obviously he's a he's well known to Andy French, who in fact it was Andy French I think who gave him his first start in sevens rugby. He had grown up playing uh, rugby with uh, Randwick, which is obviously the home of probably Australia's most famous uh, winger, Dev Campisi. And apparently, according to Andy Friend, he was actually an out-half when he started playing rugby. 
So he moved into the sevens program. And I think it was Andy Friend who gave him his first international start, that's for sure. And obviously, you know, Andy Friend w- would not have brought him over here if there wasn't the opportunity and he obviously, and he didn't think highly of him. And I suppose it was because he had that massive injury and which obviously, and I think the timing of it was as I think ahead of the um, Olympic games for the the sevens. And so I think obviously a decision had to be made. And I think Andy Friend was, was quick to offer him a spot over here, knowing that he wouldn't be able to play for a while because of the injury. He says that, you know, he's he's a player who looks like he's not running fast, but yet he can be well ahead of the fella chasing him. So that's that's what we need from, you know, from the back a player in the back three, that's for sure. Says he's he's a he's a he's a clever lad, apparently. He's got a smart, smart rugby brain. And probably the most positive thing about him is that he actually has Kiwi blood. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Um, and I think I, was there mention of Oshin Dowling possibly making an appearance, which would be yes. He said he's back as well. He's back training. Um, he didn't with us. He didn't actually say that he was going to be playing or starting, but he did make mention of the fact possibly he could come on the bench. I'm not sure. We're going to need everybody available that we can this week because Leinster in the RDS is um, not exactly a happy hunting ground for Connacht, considering we've never actually won in the RDS. No, the last time we beat Leinster in Leinster was in Donnybrook in 2002. Lindy, are you expecting another hammering this week? I'm not expecting a hammering. Um, I'm expecting a, a different a different Connacht to take, to take the field. I think it always... You know, if you're looking at a team with consistency, then obviously, Leinster, look, Leinster have everything, don't they? They have the players, they have the numbers, they have the pedigree. As Andy Fred said, they have the coaches, um, you know. So they have, you know, the, the demographics of a, of a city where they've just got a huge population, you know, of, of rugby players. They have the school system is what I think Andy Friend also alluded to. So when, you know, whenever you go up there, you always, you're always really on the hind foot in, in terms of... Um, expectation but I think there's always a time when Connacht play well and that is when sometimes their backs are against the wall sometimes when they have to go out and prove that they're better than what you know the last weekend's match shows and I think Connacht need a big game um I think as well last week's game with Ulster showed really the type of game that Connacht are well able to play and they could be the ones to play that game that is get in their faces Mm -hmm. there was you know the energy level needs to be lifted a bit the aggression possibly controlled aggression of course needs to be lifted a bit but I think when Connacht have shown as they did in the opening round of the Champions Cup when they got in their faces against a team like racing you know it, it it really it lifts everybody within the team and it just imbues the sense of, you know, I think um, collective desire, you know, and ambition to actually, to actually win. And I think that's, you know, as long as it's controlled and as long as there's a certain amount of poise and, and, and you know, and control in the way that they play their game and their set pieces, etc. But I think it's the energy level and the attitude and the get in your face, which I think is what we, probably will get and what we would expect from them this weekend. I think Lindley's nailed it. Uh, I think the most frustrating thing that we saw last week is that Ulster had more energy than us. We weren't getting into Ulster's face as we did against Racing and against Bristol. To be honest, I'm, I I would just rather kind of, I, I'm, I'm not kind of looking for a score or anything. I'm, I'm just more interested in how we play and how we perform after last week because I just want to see a performance out of our guys to come out and just really go for it this time. Okay, well, looking looking at the weather forecast um, for Saturday evening in Dublin, it's looking as though there's only 10% chance of rain and there's only 16 kilometer an hour wind. So with a bit of luck, the pitch in the RDS is normally pretty solid and there won't be any wind and rain. So we might get the conditions collector gagging for in order to have a good game it's 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 amazing to think that Connacht need that sort of condition considering where we live <laughs> that we need to do it that we almost play too much rugby not on that case I'd, I'd, I'd have to disagree with you I think the we just got it wrong at the weekend 
that if you if you change it around and kind of have the wind that we do to Ulster, what we what they did to us, we play in the right right areas. Jack is extremely good at that, uh, pulling that kick back where he, he he steps back and puts it in the opposite corner, and we 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 we've we've done it the whole whole season where we've played in the right areas. In in our last five games, Connacht have finished with a minimum of sixty percent percent territory. We know where to play. What we need to be doing is finishing off our chances now. Yes, Lindley, is this where you think that Ben O'Donnell might be one of these guys with a bit of X factor, or will we will we get to see Bundy, or will he will he still be off? We we just need an X factor player to help us convert all this possession territory into the points we need to win. We don't know. We don't know if Ben O'Donnell is starting or if he's going to come on. We're not exactly sure yet. I think where he's going to be, where he's going to be playing, assuming assuming somewhere in the back three. I, uh, I know that you know Andy Friend did allude to the fact that he needs a little bit of time and needs a bit of patience because he is a sevens player, not a fifteens player. So I would. I would imagine that he'd probably come on as a sub. I, I I don't know, but you know he might need a little bit of time to be up there watching the games to to get a feel for how Leinster are going to play. It's always a difficult ask, isn't it? A, a player who's hasn't played one match yet. You know that's it, it, it's a tough ask. So I think you've got the makings of a really good backline there, a very exciting backline, and it will be a very good test against against the champions. And you know we don't know what sort of team they're going to put out. Um, obviously, they have a few issues at the moment with, you know, a couple of COVID cases, but they do do say the game is going ahead. That's probably because possibly the, the fellas who have the COVID cases, you know, it doesn't really impact when, when you have such a big squad. Let's face it, they're so blessed, aren't they? You know, that it doesn't really impact possibly. They just have to make sure that those who are playing are obviously, and they will be tested again and again, are COVID free. So as we're coming up to the end of the year, it was a weird year for rugby. Is there any highlight from Connacht rugby that you would think of just as the year finishes um, that, you know, just, just brought a bit of smile to your face in this horrible, horrible year? Uh, I guess the that first game back in the Aviva, playing the team that got one off us on this last week, Ulster, um, but watching, watching Connacht play with such free-flowing rugby, and how you saw what Connacht, how they want to play in that game. Um, and I hope we, we can get back to it because I just remember watching that and just, yeah, felt really, really good to just have rugby back. Okay, um, I think there's a couple of matches. One was the match here at home following that that um, bit of a disaster that we had at home and Connacht came back, you know, out fighting and produce an excellent an excellent game and I think also I think you just have to you just have to look at racing 92 game I mean you know I just who would have ever given Connacht a, not a chance apart from themselves you know to win that match and I think that has to stand up there as probably one of the most outside of the victory that Connacht secured against Toulouse the first time you know, back in what was it, 2016, I think, or 15 or 16, with with Pat Lamb, and nobody gave them the opportunity as well. I think that that performance against against Racing 92 has to be up there, and a very, a very, very who could not be proud of that performance. We just needed that extra couple of points. Indeed, and I have to agree with all of that. Um, and I'd go back to the Kings game. Some of the rugby we played in the Kings game, especially when we were down to 13 and 14 men at one stage during that game, all the way back in March, which was the last game we played before COVID kicked in. We played some astonishing rugby that day as well. But yeah, let's let's hope we can see some of that at the weekend and, and that we see plenty of fight in the guys and that, that you know they do what Connacht fans most want, which is fight to the end no matter what. We'll leave it there. Here's William with the results from last weekend and the upcoming fixtures. Happy New Year, folks. Pro 14 action last weekend, Saturday, December the 26th. Zebra versus Benetton was postponed. Dragons 12, Cardiff Blues 13. Ospreys 14, Scarlets 16. And Munster versus Leinster was postponed. On Sunday the 27th of December, Glasgow versus Edinburgh was postponed. Connacht 19, Ulster 32. 
The first Pro 14 games of 2021 start on Friday, January the 1st. Scarlets versus Dragons with a 5.15pm kickoff and a Cardiff Blues versus Ospreys with a 7.35pm kickoff. On Saturday, January the 2nd, Benetton versus Zebra with a 1pm kickoff. Edinburgh versus Glasgow with a 3pm kickoff. Ulster versus Munster with a 5.15pm kickoff. And rounding off the games, Leinster versus Connacht kicking off at 7.35 p.m. Loose, cut it loose. Break out or nothing changes. Side 